drug companies have hijacked evidence-based medicine. And um, the doctors, almost all the doctors, are trying to do their best for their patients and are sincerely committed to their life mission of helping their patients to live the healthiest lives they can. Um, I've been on the hot seat. I was a family doc in private practice for 20 years. I know how the medical community works. Almost everyone's trying to do the right thing. So the, But the problem is that they're being fed bad information. And it's so deep that when you say, and you're correct, I'm not being critical of what you're saying, but when you say, aren't most doctors committed to practicing evidence-based medicine? Mm -hmm. Well, the definition of evidence-based medicine is that they're reading their journals, the peer-reviewed journals, and they're um, looking at the quality of the trials. They got a little bit of knowledge about uh, research techniques and so forth. And the, the, the trials look like they're high quality and they're peer-reviewed. And so you can read those and you can integrate that in your prescribing habits. And then you look at the guidelines that are published um, by experts, and those become fairly clear cut about how you should practice medicine. And that good doctors, we say, are practicing evidence-based medicine because they, they follow both of uh, those sources of information. Here's the problem, Jordan. The drug companies have paid for the research. The drug companies have analyzed the research. The drug companies have written up most of the research, they sub these written up manuscripts that are brief summaries of the whole study are then submitted to journals for publication. When they're submitted to journals and the peer reviewers and the medical journal editors look at these manuscripts, they don't get to see the underlying data. They peer don't get to see the data. They don't get to see the data. I, I can't say that any more clearly. That is, I'm just, I'm highlighting that because it makes, it, it, it's like, that's like the first thing, look, I, again, never do math in public, but my math teacher was like, show your work, right? Because I want to know how you arrived to this conclusion. But instead, it sounds like the drug company pays for research, their people do the research, they own all the data, and then they say, here's our conclusion, and the peer reviewer goes, yep, looks good, and then puts it in a journal. I mean, there's got to be a little more to it, but that's kind of, that's what it sounds like you're telling me right now. That's pretty much it. And then what happens because uh, the evidence-based medicine movement has moved along because initially they said all docs should learn how to read journals and should know research uh, techniques and analysis and should make the decisions for themselves. But there's so much information that doctors can't possibly do that, and you need a, at least a master's in public health to do it anyway. So the evidence-based medicine people said, okay, we'll, we, we see that this is too much of a burden for practicing physicians, and we'll just get them the good guidelines and we'll let them follow the guidelines because the guidelines will have done that work for them and they can just follow the guidelines. That's a good system. But the problem is that the guidelines are a compendium of the studies that have been published that have not been peer reviewed and the people who write the guidelines don't have access to the underlying data. I just can't believe, I mean, I believe you, right? But I just can't, I'm in shock that they can't look at the data. So if you want to challenge something, you just can't because, and it's so easy to mess around with this and hide the ball because you don't have the data. No one can say, hey, you analyzed this wrong because they just have no basis to do that. Correct. Now, occasionally a really good peer reviewer or a really good medical journal editor will say, hey, that's not clear. Will you send me some data to back that up or something? So it's not that that can't happen in private communication but it doesn't happen. I assume in the, in the real world. The, the temptation then is for these companies and I'm not accusing anyone of anything but the temptation certainly would be to manipulate the data to get the conclusion that you want for a new drug that you just spend a billion dollars creating. That that's exactly right. And I you're a lawyer. Yeah. I spent 10 years in litigation as an expert uh, uh as an expert witness. Mm -hmm. I've seen what's in the corporate computers. There's usually about 20 million documents per case in litigation. Literally, huh? Yeah, literally. Yeah. And I could query anything about those 20 million documents. It's like a kid in a toy shop. So I could ask any question of the data and the, um, you know, the lawyer geeks who've got it, the, the uh, spreadsheets and the database all set will give me the documents. And if it gets too complicated for me as a, 
um, as a family doc who did two years of a research fellowship, um, the lawyers hire PhD um, uh, statisticians and epidemiologists wow. and so forth to work with. So I know what's in the data. And I can tell you that it often doesn't represent what's going on. For example, I was in civil litigation with a drug called Bextra. It, it was like Vioxx. It's an anti-inflammatory drug that really provided no better pain relief and supposedly was gentle around the stomach, but that's a dubious claim. So I was in, and there was a little bit of a cardiovascular issue. So I was in the civil litigation that came after Vioxx litigation. I was in that too, but the Bextra litigation was after. It was much smaller. Um, there were 8,000 plaintiffs who uh, alleged cardiovascular injury due to Bextra in you, that you, litigation. You said a little bit of a cardio. I don't mean to laugh at this. A little bit of a cardiovascular issue sounds like. Can that? Can there, is there a such thing as a little bit of a cardio? Like, there's the, a little problem with your heart. Nothing to worry about, except for no, that it might kill you. There's no such thing as a little bit of uh, of heart problem, but right. there is such a thing as an expert signing a protective order and not being able to talk about what he knows. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> Understood. Okay. okay. So I did the civil litigation and the the uh, case settled. The, 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 the award to the 8,000 plaintiffs was settled and it's secret and nobody can talk about it. And I don't know what it, what the what it was, though I know what the parameters of these kinds of settlements are. But I felt that the company had not behaved in a way that represented scientific values, that honored scientific values. That, that was my feeling. And I got in touch with the Department of Justice to uh, share that feeling without sharing any confidential information. And one thing led to another, and they soon sent me a federal subpoena, like the January 6th Mm -hmm. is sending out federal. It means a big deal. You know, a guy drives up in the car and says, "You must appear at the FBI headquarters, and the Department of Justice will be there, and you must bring your computer and so forth." So I go, and I, I as as an expert in civil litigation, I had spent a lot of time figuring out what I thought had happened, and wrote a report about what I thought had happened, and I shared all that information, and and the FBI folks who were there and the DOJ folks that were there were incredibly impressive people. Uh, many of them knew a lot about this case. They were thinking hard. They were questioning me as hard. They were pushing me as hard as a good defense attorney pushes me in deposition to uh, kind of, you know, kick my tires and make sure that I knew what I was talking about. They did a good job. And Six months later, they don't. They keep their cards very close to their chest. And sure. I didn't hear any follow up. Yeah, the FBI is not going to keep you posted on their investigation. Generally, yeah, exactly, exactly. So six months later, I read in the paper that Pfizer had been slapped with the largest criminal fine in U.S. history for what they had done. Wow. With extra. Wow. One point one nine five billion dollars. <laughs> wow. And, and but unfortunately, that's like they can chocolate up to the cost of. They can chalk that up to the cost of doing business, I would assume, at some point. Uh, that one's close, and Vioxx was close. But nobody went to jail. Nobody, yeah. they didn't lose money, you know. So e even when they blow it completely, except maybe for the Sacklers, though that's not over yet. Uh, but even when they blow it completely with a disaster like Vioxx that killed forty to 60,000 Americans, even then— wow. They break even. 